Savior, Jesus the Christ. Last week, I spoke about Star Trek and how it was set in places far, far away. This week, Jesus and his disciples are the ones who venture into a place that is far, far away. Perhaps not terribly far in actual miles, but to a different world nonetheless, to the opposite side of the Sea of Galilee, into Gentile territory. In Luke's Gospel, this is the only entry Jesus makes into Gentile territory, so what takes place here must be important. The first person Jesus meets upon landing on the far shore of the Sea of Galilee is a man from Gerasenes who is possessed by demons. This man is so controlled by demons that he cannot even be among other people, at least not living ones. Instead, he lives out in the tombs amongst the dead, naked like the animals. That must have been some welcoming for Jesus and his disciples, a naked wild man. And yet, the demons in this man recognize Jesus. They not only know Jesus' name, but that he is son of the Most High God. This is a common theme throughout all the Gospels, that demons recognize Jesus as the Son of God, even when those closest to Jesus do not. The demons also recognize Jesus' authority over them, another area that the disciples and the rest of us humans do not always recognize or acknowledge. These demons, and it is plural in this man's case, their name, Legion, tells us something about the number of demons that may be in this one man. In Roman terms, Legion would have been 6,000 men. These demons seem to realize what's coming next, that Jesus is about to evict them from their home at this, in this poor man. But rather than be left homeless in the abyss, they ask to be sent to a herd of nearby pigs. Now, if we didn't already know that the disciples were in Gentile territory, the existence of a herd of pigs would be a dead giveaway. Jesus agrees to the demon's request though their home in the pigs is short-lived, as the madness induced by the demon possession makes the pigs run into the lake. The transformation of the possessed man is nothing short of miraculous. This man who once wandered around naked in the wilds and the tombs now sits quietly and clothed at Jesus' feet as the townspeople come to see what has happened. Yet instead of rejoicing that this man has been healed, they are afraid. Perhaps they are afraid that their herd of animals will be the next one to be destroyed. Perhaps they are simply afraid of anyone who could heal so easily a man who had been so destructive to himself and others for so many years. It is certainly not unusual to fear something so far beyond our understanding and our experience. We don't give much credence to demon possession these days. We consider ourselves to be more enlightened. We know that those who used to be thought of as demon-possessed were probably just mentally ill or perhaps had a physical disease such as epilepsy. Yet those with serious mental illness, such as sociopaths and schizophrenics, despite being correctly diagnosed, can be just as harmful, sometimes even evil in their effects on others, as they were in Jesus' day. And we can still see human beings possessed as completely as any demon possession when we observe those who are struggling with addictions to alcohol, drugs, or gambling, to name but a few. Their possession is no less damaging for being explainable. Their possession is no less isolating just because treatment is available. And their acceptance back into society is no less difficult once they are treated. The healed demoniac in our gospel wants to go with Jesus. Perhaps he just wants to continue to be with the one who healed him. Perhaps he wants to be around Jesus in case he has a relapse. Or perhaps he realizes that it will not be easy to be accepted by his own people, even though he is now healed. How could these people forget his wild, unpredictable, outrageous behavior? Will he ever be accepted as he is now, healed and lucid? Or will he be stared at or rebuffed because of who he was 
and how he used to behave. Yet this is the mission Jesus gives him. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. We are told that the man did that. We don't know the outcome, whether he was ever accepted by his people, whether they believed that he was truly healed, whether or not he was an effective evangelist. And I think I know why we aren't told what happens to this man. Because that part of the story isn't the important part. The former demoniac's mission wasn't to convert people or start a church, but rather to just tell the story of all God has done. Perhaps we would find evangelism a less threatening activity if we thought of it as just telling our story, the story of what God has done for each of us, how we too have been healed. Not with a mind for what someone else might do in our place, not worrying about whether other people may think of us, not worrying about results, but simply sharing the story of God's people, including us. The stories of God's work in this world and in us, and stories of God's love for everyone. That's all we are called to do, to tell the story, to proclaim the good news. We aren't called to change people's hearts and minds. That's God's job. But we are called to help prepare the way by sharing God's love in word and in deed with all that we meet. And to nurture and be nurtured by those who gather with us here each week, to listen to the familiar stories, to sing God's praises, and to pray that all might find healing as the former demoniac did. Amen. We sing our hymn of the day, number 614. I invite you to stand as you are able.